Well, good morning, good morning. It's great to see you all on this wonderful Palm Sunday. So we prepare for Holy Week. Just We do have a few announcements, and then we're going to welcome some new members. Right out of the gate, just want to let you know everything we're going to announce this morning, you can see on our website at gatewaybaptist.com under the News and Events tab. It has all this information of upcoming events, uh, ways you can get connected, and things we can enjoy in the body. First thing is this afternoon is our other every other week prayer time at 4.30 p.m. However, the only difference is today it's going to be in the gym building at 4.30 prayer time over in the gym building. Also, we have a wonderful weekend coming up, as we all know, for Easter. Uh, we have a good Friday service we're going to have here at 7 p.m. this Friday. We encourage you all to come, a reflective time of prayer, songs, and communion. There will not be any child care, but we still invite you to please come with your children to uh, enjoy that time together. It will be about a one-hour service. So that's this Friday night at 7 o'clock. Then we have an opportunity to join in with a few other churches. We've been doing this for almost 12 to 15 years now. Um, an Easter sunrise service right up the road here on Bell Road at Grace Presbyterian Church. Um, it's at 6.30 a.m. And uh, they also have a breakfast immediately following. So if you desire to come to that and come to the breakfast, we just ask that you please, please bring a breakfast goodie. Please bring something that you can share uh, with the rest of the group. It's been a wonderful many, over a decade we've been doing this with Grace Presbyterian, Legacy Anglican. Uh, this year, Young Meadows Presbyterian is going to join us as well. It's just a wonderful time of fellowship with the body of Christ. And obviously next Sunday is the same schedule. We have 9 o'clock Bible study and then the service here at 1030. Also a friendly reminder, Friday, April 5th at 6 p.m., we have our wonderful Gateways Got Talent show we're very excited about. Uh, we would love for all of you to come to support those who are going to be able to showcase their wonderful talents the Lord has given them. It's not too late to uh, enter anything into the artwork exhibition. If you want to do that, you can contact the office or see Lisa Glasscock because we're going to have art all over here and down the halls uh, to show um, just a wonderful gifting of art in so many different facets, all different types. And lastly, for April, um, we also have Secret Church. We're going to remind you of the simulcast Friday, April 19th at 6 p.m. with David Platt. This year we're going through uh, verse by verse the book of Ruth. Now it is free for all Gateway members and attendees. So we ask you if you want, when you register, that you use the promo code Secret Church. 2024 and that will bypass the cost that sometimes we do have some friends and family and others from um, in the community that like to come to that that we have to charge for the book but um, for y'all of you and for the attendees it's free so use the code secret church 2024 very excited about that time on April 19th and lastly we've mentioned this a couple weeks Friday May 3rd guys uh, so father son and grandfather time uh, for an adventure um, overnight trip to the battleship down in Mobile for boys 6 to 18 years old uh, Friday May 3rd registration deadline is April 1st so again all that information again the details and registration are on the website as well so just to prepare for that there's limited amount of uh, places um, so get on that guys if you want to participate and enjoy that time together I'm going to ask our pastor to come up to introduce some new members well, last week we had the joy of introducing several new families in the church, and the Kellys were not able to be with us, but they're back this morning. So, Will and Laura and your kids, come on up here. We want to introduce you guys as new members of the church. Well, this is Will and Laura Kelly. They moved here about a year ago from Minnesota. So welcome to the humidity and welcome to the heat of Alabama here. They came to be closer to their family, but also to start a homestead. So they live a little ways out here. Will just finished about a year ago his MDiv degree, a Master's of Divinity from Bethlehem Seminary in Minnesota. Currently works as an RN, as a nurse, but with a desire for ministry. He enjoys talking theology, working his land, and wrestling with his kids. Laura homeschools their kids. She loves gardening, homesteading, and reading old books. Now, you see there are four kids up here. You got Joseph, who loves to read and play board games, and he's really good at it. I've seen him play those at our house, and he's fantastic at it. Arden loves to rollerblade around the house and tell stories to her siblings. Irene likes to rollerblade with her sister and do gymnastics on the trampoline, and Daniel likes to snuggle with his cats and wrestle with his family. We're thrilled to welcome you guys into membership at Gateway. Let's give them a round of applause. Thanks, guys. 
Just a reminder to our visitors who are with us, if you'd like to learn more about being a part of this community of faith, two opportunities coming up for you in two weeks on April 7th. The first is our foundations class. It is a four-week membership class required for membership here, and that will begin two weeks from today at 9 a.m. during the Bible study hour. And then we also have right after that, that same Sunday, something called Discover Gateway, and that's a lunch at my house where we can talk to you more about the big picture vision of the church and what it looks like to be involved in community here. And so we'd love to invite you to do both of those. Details are on the website, gatewaybaptist.com. All right. Song. Just want to read a scripture here for Palm Sunday as we celebrate this Passion Week and what the Lord came to do for us. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to him saying, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it just as it was written. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones themselves would cry out. Let's worship our king this morning.
This will be our release song. We are not.
as we come to this day of celebrating Palm Sunday, looking forward to the, the next week. Lord, just let us set in what you truly did for us as we share with our family, our children, those around us at work, our school, Lord, that we would give an example of a life that is filled with Christ, Lord, that you would remove our selfishness or that you would just plant in us a boldness to, sh to share that truth, Lord, that you died for us, that we are going to learn about and study and pray about this next coming week, God. Thank you for Gateway and just the ability to openly gather for corporate worship each each week. Thank you. What we just sang about, that you will hold us fast, Lord, through the storms of life, through the, the ups and the downs, God. No matter what we know, we can turn to you and you will be there for us. Lord, we want to lift up um, this morning just the parents of Gateway. Lord, from the youngest parents of the, the newest newborns, Lord, all the way to the grandparents or even the great-grandparents, God. 
you've placed children in our life as a blessing. Lord, it's never a surprise to you when they are present in our life. And just we, uh, we're humbled by the fact that we don't have it all, that we, can, we cannot do it all in parenting these children. We have to rely on you or that we would um, just go to you daily with our children's salvation request, God. We know it's not an act that we can do ourselves. It's only through um, you and your salvation grace, Lord. We pray that over our children and for the, all the children of Gateway. Thank you for the parents and those who are, um, Lord, seeking you in the, in the highs and the lows of the parenting woes and in the celebrations of life, God. And Lord, in Acts chapter 1, you, after you've given the Holy Spirit, Lord, you told us to go share to Judea, Sumeria, and to the ends of the world. And each week we gather and um, do the same, God. We pray this morning for Dalreda Baptist and, um, Lord, their search for a, a new worship minister there. We pray for uh, Pastor Tommy. He's in his first year over there leading the congregation in, in the Dalreda community at um, that church. We just pray that you would bring along the right individual that you have already started calling and wooing, Lord, with your spirit, that they would be um, just a perfect fit for that church, and that they would be um, one with uh, Pastor Tommy Fike over there, that they would be uh, in community together, and that um, it would be a great fit. Lord, we also pray for our local um, bodies of government, Lord, for Governor Ivey, for Mayor Stephen Reed, and all the city council and officials, God, that, um, Lord, at first of all, if they don't know you, that you would be planting seeds around them, that they would hear little snippets here and there of the gospel and they would be interested in Lord uh, just grow in their faith and knowledge of you God and that you would ultimately save them and Lord if they do proclaim that they are a believer that you would have them have the the boldness to um, just lead our city and our government um, Lord with a, a gospel centered focus or with gospel lenses over their eyes and each decision and each um, conversation Lord they would have that in the back of their head and on the um, just on the forefront of their tongues, Lord, when they speak about whatever's going on around. Um, and Lord, as we go further out with our prayer, we reach out today with um, a community is raising up a church in Punjab, India. They're um, several, several hours ahead. They're probably sleeping right now. And Lord, even that, we pray for the Gondola people. They're in the northern state of Punjab in India. And um, there's two individuals, Ravi and Sanjita. Lord, starting a church there. God, it's a place filled with... Um, just so much evil and darkness, God. We pray that they would be light there, that they would be salt, that they would be seen as people who are different, Lord, that they would be kind and compassionate, just like you are to us. And that, Lord, everybody who is called to be there, you would um, just do your magical work, Lord, of the Holy Spirit moving in people, uh, especially for these two leaders, that you would uh, just provide them with um, encouragement, Lord, if they need financial assistance, Lord, that it would just flow easily, Lord, that it would just all happen supernaturally because of you, God, not because of their and themselves. Um, Lord, thank you for the uh, the offerings you give each week through our congregation here, um, Lord, that we would be good stewards of all the uh, finances that you provide us to be um, just in charge of. God, thank you for Pastor Grady as he's coming to bring the word this morning, and as we uh, are looking at genealogies and just in Genesis studying, Lord, the, uh, the beginnings of your word. Thank you so much for a pastor who um, diligently seeks and studies you and your, your, your goodness and your grace, Lord. We pray all this in your name. Amen. And boys and girls who are first to fourth grade who'd like to head to kids' worship, you may head that way. So first to fourth graders, you got Mr. Kevin and Miss Amy Lynn today. Why don't you find Genesis chapter 5 in your copy of God's Word? And you also need a handout this morning. So hopefully you got one of these. You came if not, Miss Jennifer's back there. Raise your hand if you don't have a handout and need one. My boys are down here, have them, and Jennifer's back here. Does anyone else still need one? I think over there, anyone else in the back need it? Okay. Yeah, this will, this will be helpful for this morning. So your eyes are not playing a trick on you if you're looking at the handout here. Yes, you see before you 32 verses. This morning, you're used to me teaching one or two a week, and we are going to, by God's grace, attempt to look at 32 verses this morning. Now, before you make a run for the door on that, we have a handout here to help us understand this, because the reason we're doing 32 verses at once 
is because this is a genealogy that we're looking at in Genesis chapter 5. Now, let me remind you what a genealogy is. This is the second one we've seen in Scripture, but a genealogy is simply a record of the descent of a person from their ancestors. So it shows you the generations that led to the person who's there today. Some people might call it a family tree. Now, for some of you, this may be the first time you've ever studied a genealogy or heard a genealogy taught. Now, if we're honest, when we come to our daily Bible reading and we get to genealogies, what do we do? Okay, it's names, next chapter, or we quickly read through it. So why are we taking a whole message this morning at a worship service to look at a genealogy? Well, for one, we're studying through Genesis 1 through 11, verse by verse. And so this is part of the text as we look through these foundations of our faith. Genealogies are part of God's Word for us. And as strange as it may sound, genealogies are actually good for us. I want to show you two scriptures to kind of cast the view of why we're doing this. First, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You know this well. All scripture is breathed out by God. So how much of it? What's that first word? All. all. There's no asterisk there in my Bible that says except for the genealogies. This all scripture includes the genealogies. That means even the genealogies are breathed out by God and therefore they're profitable for us. They're good for us, for reproof, for correction, for training, and righteousness. Why? Verse 17, so that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. That means even the genealogies and the list of names are useful in God's providence that we would know him more and we're equipped by him to do the work he's called us to do. And I hope you'll see that this morning. Also, Romans chapter 15, verse 4. We looked at this several weeks ago, but I want to remind us of this truth. Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. Now, former days is the Old Testament period. So all the Old Testament is written for our instruction. That includes the genealogies. They're for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, including the genealogies, we might have hope. And so even the list of names like this morning can instruct us, can encourage us, and can give us hope. Now, to understand this genealogy before we look at the text, like all of Scripture, the context is really important to understand what we are looking at today. Now, remember two weeks ago, we looked through Genesis chapter 4. That was the first genealogy, and that was the genealogy of Cain, the first child on earth, but also the first murderer. And in the gene genealogy in Genesis 4 showed us the world getting increasingly sinful, increasingly corrupt, increasingly dark and evil. And so the question that gets raised is, what are God's people to do in a dark world? What are God's people to do in a world full of sin and evil? And that's what Genesis 5 is here to show us. And we got a little foretaste of it at the end of Genesis 4 as it transitions to our text today. Genesis chapter 4, verse 26 that we looked at last week. To Seth also a son was born. And he called his name Enosh. And at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. Chapter 5 expounds that idea. What we saw last week is that in the midst of an evil world, there is a remnant of God's people who hope in God and his plans, who hope in God's promises, who hope in the nature of God. And what do they do? They respond to that hope by calling upon the name of the Lord. If you remember last week, we said that calling on the name of the Lord involves worship, praising him. It involves prayer, talking to him. It's really about knowing him more. But calling his name also involves proclamation of making him known to others. And Genesis 5 is going to unpack that for us. It's going to show us a remnant of God's people who call on his name as they seek to know him more and as they proclaim him to others. And so chapter 5 builds on that truth, giving us generations that hope in God, generations that want to know God more, generations that make God known in a very hostile world. Now, before we re read our text this morning, a word on the handout. This is here to help us this morning. Now, some of you know, if you've been around Gateway before, it's not the first time you've seen something like this. You know, as I begin my studies each week, I diagram the text. So it's just God's Word is powerful, and that's what we want to guide us. So I try to break it apart to see the flow of thought of it. And this week, I want you to have that too, because it'll help you see the patterns we see here. As you look through this genealogy, yes, it's front and back. You see the big number orange. Just know that's not part of the Scripture. I put those in there because there's 10 generations in this genealogy. This goes from Adam all the way to Noah, which is the next section of Genesis that will be beginning after Easter. So you have the 10 generations listed out there for you. And you're going to see a regular pattern over and over again. If you look down this list of this handout, you will quickly see, wow, it looks like the same pattern. The names and ages change. And that's exactly right. You will see the same thing over and over and over. But there's three places in the genealogy where the wording changes. And I highlighted those for you. And you'll see those because that's where God is drawing our attention to something different, something significant. When that pattern is broken, it's there to drive home a very important point for us. And so as we read Genesis 5 this morning, there's really two things I want you to be looking for as we look at this text. First of all, who are we? 
Because this is a text about the identity of God's people. So who are we? This is not just a random list of names. There's truth in here from the introduction down through the names of who we are as the people of God. And then from that, I want you to be thinking about how are we to live in this world? Because that's ultimately what these names are here for. They're showing how God's people lived in a very hostile world. So who are we and what is our identity? So yes, I want us to read all this text together. So I'm going to ask you to stand. Please get a long stretch break this morning to stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. Genesis chapter 5, you can follow along in your copy of God's Word on that handout because it's just the scripture broken down or on the screen as well. Genesis chapter 5, I'm reading out the English Standard Version. Genesis 5.1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he fathered Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he fathered Kenan. Enosh lived after he fathered Kenan 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he fathered Mahalahel. Kenan lived after he fathered Mahalahel 840 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Kenan were 920 years, and he died. When Mahalahel had lived 65 years, he fathered Jared. Mahalahel lived after he fathered Jared 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Mahalahel were 895 years, and... He died. When Jared had lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. Jared lived after he fathered Enoch 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God, and he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 360 years, 365 years. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Lamech lived after he fathered Noah 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that you've given us your word. And Lord, this morning we thank you for the genealogies, as strange as that may seem. Lord, I pray that you would help us understand your word. I pray your word would come alive. You'd help us see the wonders here. You'd help us see you here. You'd help us see your character, your nature, and your attributes. And I pray this list of names when we leave this morning would no longer just be a list of names to us. But it'd be something that would encourage us, convict us, and challenge us to be the people you desire us to be in this world of sin and darkness that we live into. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, to understand this genealogy, there's four truths up front before we kind of dig into this, to the names and the genealogy and what they mean that I want you to see from the beginning here. First of all, I want you to understand this genealogy is separate from that of Cain. This is completely different from the genealogy we saw back in chapter 4. Go back to the very first verse of verse 1 here of Genesis 5. This is the book of the generations of Adam. Now, I mentioned it last week, but this word generations is a Hebrew word toledot. It occurs 10 different times in this book, and each time it introduces a new section of Genesis. So Genesis 5.1 begins a new section of Genesis, and it tells us what follows this line of Adam and Seth. Therefore, it is said to be a contrast with chapter 4. Chapter 4 was the line of Cain that rejects God, that hates God, that as we saw gains the world but loses their soul. Chapter 5 here is to be the line that shows us people who gain eternal life, whose soul is healthy with the Lord. Here is a line of faith. And the reason that distinction is important is because you will see similar names here. You see a guy named Enoch. He's in the seventh generation here. You also saw Enoch in chapter 4. There's a Lamech here in generation 9. There's a Lamech back in chapter 4. These are different people. This is a contrast. These are not overlapping lines. So I was just curious. Here at Gateway, I looked. We have six Johns at Gateway. 
That's a common name. You know a lot of Johns. We have six Johns here at Gateway. So if I said, John, stand up, several Johns would stand up in the room right now, right? That's the same thing back then. There were common names back then, and Lamech and Enoch were common names. So as you read through chapter 4 and 5, don't get confused and think these are the same people. These are different sides of the Toledot. These are different lines, very different approaches towards faith and a relationship with God. So this is a separate genealogy from Cain. Number two, there's a common structure, a common pattern here. I've referenced this earlier, and I think you saw it as you were reading. You see the same structure throughout, the, throughout this thing. You see it's used the exact same way six different times, only the names and the ages are different. So, for example, go to ver- generation number two here, verses six through eight here, and you'll see this pattern. When Seth had lived 105 years, he fathered Enosh. Seth lived after he fathered Enosh 807 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. You can tell you that same formula six different times here verbatim, and you just change the name and change the dates, and it's the same thing here. Now, this is important when you see this. First of all, it's important because the repetition is here to teach us truth. So, for example, you see that phrase over and over on the right side, he fathered. Molly really wanted me to read as he begat over and over the way the older Bibles did, but, but he begat or he fathered. It's this important word here. This is more than just they had kids, friends. This is reminding us in a world full of sin, that God is still blessing his people. God is still working through sinful people to accomplish his purpose, particularly his purpose of Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, where he had told the people back in Genesis 1, 28, to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. This is a sinful world now, but yet God is still blessing his people so that they are fathering, they are raising up the next generation. You see other phrases repeated there. I have it in red for you over and over. And he died, and he died, and he died, and he died. This is a single word in the Hebrew, the word weyamot. It's an emphasized word. It's literally the last word of every refrain. And this is important because it reminds us that we serve a holy God and a just God, and God will deal with every sin. It also reminds us that God is faithful. He will keep all of his promises, like Genesis chapter 2, verse 17. In Genesis 2, 17, he told them, But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And so Genesis 5 is a testimony in the repetition that God keeps his promise. He died because God said it would happen. He died because God said it would happen over and over and over. And friends, they remind us this can be said of each single one of us too. And so this pattern reminds us of these truths, that God's purposes will stand, that God is holy and just and faithful. But what then draws our attention are the places the pattern is broken. Because each time the pattern is broken in a genealogy, it's because God is drawing our attention. It's like a red flag saying, Zone in here, look at this, there's something I want you to see that's different here. And you see this at three different places, it's highlighted for you in here. First in the generation of Adam, go back to verse 3 in the first generation. When Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him. Totally different phrasing, why? Because there's a lesson here we'll see in a minute about our responsibility in this world. You see in the seventh generation with Enoch there, and the seventh generation is highlighted in blue for you. When Enoch had lived 65 years, this is verse 21 and 22, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah. Okay, there's a change here. He didn't just live, he walked with God. There's a lesson here for us about our priority and how we live in a dark world. You see this also in generation 9 here with this guy named Lamech, different Lamech than chapter 4 here, verses 28 and 29. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered his son and called his name Noah, saying, out of the ground the Lord is cursed. This one shall bring us Relief. There's a change here in what has said because there's a lesson here about hoping in, the, in God. And then finally, verse 10, something is missing here. Or sorry, in chapter 10, or generation 10, verse 32. After Noah was 500 years old, Noah fathered Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Notice there's no and he died here. Why? Because that's going to come in chapter 9, verse 29. God has three chapters for us here about the life of Noah. We need to know before we get to 929, all the days of Noah are 950 years and he died. All these variations are here to point truth out to us that we'll explore in just a moment. Third thing I want you to see about these genealogies, these details remind us this is literal history. So for example, go back to the eighth generation, verse 25, Methuselah. When Methuselah lived 170, 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech 782 years. He had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Methuselah were, I can't imagine this, 969 years. And then he died. There's great care recorded for us of names and how old they were when they had their kid, how old they were when they died. Why? Because this is historical records for us. It's history preserved for us. In fact, this is the only authentic record we have at this time period. 
The great flood that's going to come in Noah's time is going to wipe out all of humanity except for one family. It's going to wipe out all the records of what happened. And yet God in his grace has preserved for us a literal record so we know what happened from the ten generations from Adam to Noah before the flood. Unless we think this is not actual literal history here, I want to remind us these same names appear in the Gospels to Jesus' genealogy because These are not just random names for us. God is showing us his faithfulness to his promise. So he gives us history so we understand the Messiah is going to come through this line. So, for example, Luke chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. This is the genealogy of Christ, the Messiah. Jesus, when he began his ministry, was about 30 years of age, being the son, I was supposed, of Joseph, the son of Heli. Verse 24, the son of Matthew, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janai, the son of Joseph. So you start seeing this pattern in Luke's genealogy. But here's where it ties back to our text. You skip 12 verses, which are all these other names. You come to Luke chapter 3, verse 36. The son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxad, said, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech. Okay, start seeing names we've just read in our genealogy. Here they are, and then it keeps going. The son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalahel, the son of Canaan. That's just a Greek spelling for Kenan here, same thing. The son of Enos, which is short for the one we saw here, Enosh. The son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. You have the exact same names from Genesis 5 and Luke 3, showing us that these are actual historical people that God worked through, through which the seed of the Messiah would come. We've given literal history here of the first ten generations on earth through whom the Messiah would come. Last thing about this genealogy before we dig into the message of it, this shows us that God cares about each person. And don't miss that about the genealogies. It shows us that God cares about each person. Now, friends, be honest. If you were writing scripture, would you include this long list of random names? I don't think I would have. But it shows us something about the character of God here because these are people that God has made. These are people that he knows by name. These are people he loves and he wants to use for his purposes. It's very similar to what he would tell Moses in Exodus chapter 33, verse 17. I love what he says to him. The Lord said to Moses, the very thing that you've spoken, I will do for you found favor in my sight and I know you by name. Now friends, the reality for us of these 10 generations here, these names are obscure to us. We know very little about Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalahel, Jared, Methuselah, or Lamech. We know very little about them, but they were important to God. They were important to God personally, and they're important in God's plan. So God records their names for us, not only to tell us who they are, but to remind us he knows your name too. And you may be obscure in world history. Most of us will be obscure in world history, but we do not escape the notice of our God who plans to use us for his purposes. So that's kind of the big overview of the genealogy. Let's dig into the text more to understand the lessons we have for it. First of all, from the introduction of the genealogy, which is verses 1 and 2, we learn about our nature as people. These are not just random names. These are people like us with a certain nature God has given. So look back at verses 1 and 2 and look at what it introduces about the nature of humanity. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man, and they were created. So what do we learn about us? Not just these names here. What do we learn about us here? Three truths about humanity here. First of all, people are made by God to be his image bearers. People are made by God to be his image bearers. Look back at verse 1 here of our text. In verse 1, you see this here. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. This is the same truth that Pastor C.J. taught on some months ago on this, back from Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, when we saw that idea introduced, that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Unlike anything else in all creation stands humanity, as people made in the likeness of God, as spiritual creatures with a spirit, with a soul, ones who share some of the attributes of God and have a unique place in God's plan. We are made in the image of God. Now, why is it repeated here for us? Think about chapter 4 again, how evil, how corrupt the world has become. And the point of it here is that sin has not destroyed the image of God from humanity. It's blurred it in ways where it's hard to see. It's obscured it, but it does not take it away. That even sinful people born still are image bearers of God. Even though we're corrupted by sin, we are all still image bearers of God. Everyone in this room today is an image bearer of God, even though we've all sinned this week. So it reminds us that as humanity, we are image bearers. Number two... It reminds us that we are distinctly male or female. We are distinctly male or female. Go back to verse 2 here. Male and female, he created them. Now, this is repeated what said earlier in Genesis. In our world of great confusion today, God is very clear that gender is given to us in his goodness. It's his idea. 
It's his plan, it's his design, and friends, it's his assignment. And it's mentioned here because this genealogy is showing us the fulfillment of Genesis 1.28. We saw it a minute ago, but it takes us back to that text. God blessed them and said, and then be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And to state the obvious, that takes both male and female together. So God reminds us at the outset of the genealogy that gender and sexuality is all his good plan. It's not something that came about from the fall. It's God's good gift to humanity pre Fall. And you see that idea of the different genders repeated throughout. For example, verse 10 in the third generation here. Notice this phrase over and over. Enosh lived after your father Kenan 815 years, and he had other sons and other daughters. It could have said he had other children, but it points out sons and daughters because you see that God's plan for the two genders all throughout this. So they're distinctly male or female. But one more thing in the introduction here of the genealogy. People are blessed by God. People are blessed by God. Go back to verse 2. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them. Now, this is the blessing we see all the way back at the beginning we've been looking at, that God blesses his creation to accomplish his purposes. It's not he's blessing them to be rich or to fulfill their own dreams. This is the blessing of doing what God has called humanity to do. So here in view, he's blessing his people. So even though they're sinners, they can still get married. Even though they're sinners, they can still have children. Even though they're sinners, they can make him known to the next generation. Even though they're still sinners, they can make Christ known to the lost around. Even though they're sinners, they can still worship him and walk with him. And even though sin corrupts, they still can experience the blessing of God in this life to do what God has called them to do. He reminds us of who we are and who we are in him is our identity. But there's a reality check for us as well. That's not just a reality for us. That's the reality of every person we meet on the planet. That everyone, whether they believe or not, still are image bearers of God and deserve to be treated that way. Everyone on the planet is either male or female. Everyone on the planet still experiences the general common grace blessings of God to do what God has called humanity to do. So go back to verse 1. If God created man, he made them in the, Im in the likeness or image of God. That includes the person who persecutes believers who we pray for. That includes that very difficult person at your work. That includes a very difficult person at church. That includes your child in your home, regardless of how annoying they've been that day, they're still an image bearer of God, right? Sin mars it, sin can obscure it, but image bearing remains. That means every person we meet and interact with, we need to remember they too are an image bearer of God, regardless of how they treat us. So before we go on, there's a question I want you to pause and think on. How are you doing remembering that you yourself are an image bearer of God? How are you doing remembering that, yes, I have sin in my life, but I still am an image bearer of God. I still experience God's blessing. I still can fulfill God's purposes. But friends, how are you doing remembering that for the people who most push your buttons and drive you crazy at work or in the community or in your neighborhood? How are you doing remembering they too are image bearers of God and deserve to be treated like that? That's the foundation of the genealogy. And it's there because all these people who come after this are either male or female. They are image bearers of God and they are blessed by God to accomplish his purposes, just like all that we will come in contact with as well. Now, how are we to live then? If that's who we are, how are we to live? And that's what this genealogy shows us, particularly in those three places it departs from the normal pattern of the genealogy. It shows us how God wants us to live in a sinful, dark, and very difficult world. Three things I want you to see briefly this morning of how we're to live in this hard world. Number one, even though we're in a dark world, we're called to walk closely with God. We are called to walk closely with God. This is foundational. We see this in generation seven with Enoch. Again, the three places where it departs from the normal pattern is to call our attention to it. And one of these is Enoch here in generation seven. Look at verses 21 and 22. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. There's your key phrase. It's different from all the other generations. Enoch walked with with God. This is huge. This is the big thing for us. If you remember Cain's line from chapter 4, there was a guy named Lamech, different than this one, generation 7. He was held up as the example of the whole generation. Seventh generation here, God holds up one person. Say, this is what this generation is like here. Enoch walked with God. Now, what does that mean? Well, think about it in human terms. If someone walks with you, what do they do? They're spending time with you. They're enjoying your fellowship. They're going the same direction that you are going. They're pursuing the same goal that you are pursuing. And that's exactly what it means when we talk about walking with God. That means we are enjoying God's presence. We are spending time with Him. We're living our lives in the direction that God wants it to go. We're pursuing God's goals and His purposes for life. You realize this word walking is not a one-time thing. 
Walking is an ongoing pattern. This is describing the ongoing pattern of Enoch's life. It was not a one-time thing for Enoch. It was not he walked with God on Sundays for an hour. This was Enoch day by day, moment by moment, walked with God. And he did so for 300 years. I mean, look at verses 22 and 23. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years, and he had other sons and daughters. Thus, all the days of Enoch were 300 and 65 years. This was his ongoing experience of intimacy with God and spending time with God and pursuing knowing God and delighting in God's presence. Friends, that cannot be done apart from faith and a deep trust in who God is. That cannot be done without intentionality. You don't accidentally walk with God. Perhaps many in this room struggle with walking with God because we're not intentional about it. You don't accidentally walk with God. It's responding to God's grace and faith and intentionally taking steps to spend time with Him. Now, quick clarification. Enoch was not sinless. That's not what this text is about. Romans 3 tells us all have sinned. This is simply saying Enoch is one who had faith, who lived a life of repentance and intentionally pursued knowing God more. And he's highlighted here, not just to tell us that that's what he did, but God is saying, this is what I want for you. For all my children, God's will for you is for you to walk intimately with him, to walk with him and to know him. And so again, the question for us, but we just rush on to the next name. So are we doing this, friends? Are we walking with God or are we walking with the world? If we look at how we spend our time, if we look at our intentionality, if we look at our thoughts, all those things, are we a people who are delighting in God and wanting to walk and enjoy his presence or are we finding the world to be more appealing so the first thing that genealogy shows us in a dark and simple world is we're to be walking with God. Second of all, very similar to last week, we're called to be hoping in His promises. We're called to be hoping in His promises. Remember, this genealogy is a contrast. It's contrasting with Cain's line in chapter 4. And here it's showing people who are hoping in God. And we see that here, particularly in the ninth generation with Lamech, Noah's father. So there, verses 28 and 29, again, where the text differs. After Lamech has a son, he calls his name Noah, saying, this is verse 29, Out of the ground the Lord has cursed this one, this Noah, shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. Now think back when we saw a few weeks ago, when, when Eve names Cain, his name literally means, here he is. She was hoping that he would be the Messiah who would bring relief. And though he was not, there was a hope and expectation that the Messiah that God has promised will come, that God is going to keep his promise. And that's really very much what Noah's father is doing here as well. He's grieving over the sin and brokenness. He's longing for the Messiah to come. He's longing for the one to come to reverse all the, the challenge of the curse. And so he, in expectation, he names his son Noah, which means rest. He's longing for rest to come to God's people through this line. And then he actually explains the name here, this one shall bring us relief. So he's saying, my child and rest will bring relief. He's hoping with a messianic hope that the Messiah would come. Now, God's going to use Noah, not in the way particularly that Lamech is hoping for here, but God is going to bring rest to his people by saving the remnant from the great flood that is to come and preserving the line through whom the Messiah will come. So no, Noah is not going to be the Messiah, but Noah is the one that God will use to save the messianic Line. And yet the point for us in this is that Lamech is hoping that the Messiah would come. And again, he points us to the same example. Are we hoping for the return of the Messiah? Christ has come and we know who he is and we celebrate even next Sunday what he's done to get our redemption. But he's promised that's not the only coming, he's coming back. And so are we living our lives with an expectation? Are we instilling that expectation in our kids as well that Christ is returning and let's long for and live for that day when he returns? Or are we living like Cain's line caught up in the here and the now? And so the, the genealogy here shows us that God's will for his people is to walk with him God's will for his people is to hope in him. But one last one, God's will for his people is to make him known to the lost around them. God's will is for his people to make him known to the lost around them. And where do we make him known? There's two places highlighted in this genealogy, two examples of where God wants us to make him known. First of all, don't miss this. God wants us to make him known in our own homes. God wants us to make him known in our own homes. That our homes will be places where we talk about the Lord and where the next generation and the friends who come in hear of the glories of God. Now we see this all throughout this line. If you go back to Genesis chapter, sorry, Genesis chapter 5, verse 3 here, and go back to Adam. Again, this is where it's held up different here. When Adam had lived, verse 3, 130 years, he fathered, here's in yellow, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him. This is different than all other parts. Why? 
Because it's teaching us something here. This was not a son in the image of God. This is a son in the image of Adam, in Adam's likeness. So what in the world does that mean? It means three things, that when Adam has a son, three things happen. First of all, that son has the image of God in him. That every child born from an image bearer of God is also an image bearer of God. And so that's automatically passed on. But second of all, more sadly, it means that child is a sinner. Adam is a sinner. Now his son Seth is going to be a sinner. You're a sinner. And if you have children, your children are sinners. They got your sin nature, right? And it's so humbling when you watch your kids do the same things you've done and being going, that's just like me. They got your sin nature. Their children come in our own likeness. We can't control that. Every child that's born to a person here is going to be an image bearer of God and be a sinner. But there's a third part of what it means that he is in the likeness of Adam. And that's something that Adam could control and did control. And that has to do with faith. That Adam sought to instill in his child now faith. Now, I can't help but think this is in contrast to what happened with Cain. We don't know the whole story of Cain's rebellion. But Adam, broken and grieving over Cain's rebellion, it appears to be here, according to the scholars, that he is instilling faith in a deeper, more intentional way into Seth's line because he knows his child's image bearer of God. He knows his child is a sinner. And so he's going to do all he can to point his child to the Lord. He has a son. He fathers a son. He parents his son in his own likeness, desiring for his child to have the faith that he has. He's doing what the law would later require. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 5 to 7. This is what Adam is doing here. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Verse 6. And these words that I command you today are to be on your heart. Verse 7. You shall teach them. Here it is. Diligently. To your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. In other words, from the morning to night, whatever you're doing, let your home be filled with talk of the Lord. And it appears he, the generations followed his example on that. Because when you come to generation 7 with Enoch, go back to verse 22 here. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah, and Enoch walked with God. How did someone seven generations later know how to walk with God? He'd been taught by his father. Go back to verse 18. When Jared had lived 162 years, he fathered Enoch. So well, who, who taught Jared how to do these things? Well, his father Mahalahel. And who taught Mahalahel? His father Kenan. Who taught Kenan? His father Enosh. Who taught Enosh? It was Seth. And who taught Seth? It was Adam. You have seven generations of parents pouring in truth into their children's lives, pointing them to who God is. And that's still God's plan today for us. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. We have the same mission. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but... Bring them up in the discipline and in the instruction of the Lord. So again, before we go on, friends, just want to pause and ask us, can this be said of us in our homes and our families? Are we talking about God throughout the day? Are we talking about Him and reading the Scriptures and praying? Are we pointing our families to the Lord? Are you leading yourself and your family? And if you're not married and you don't have kids, this is not exempting you from this as well. Is your home a place to where the gospel is known, where the next generation comes in as disciple, where people can come and experience hospitality biblically and find hope in the Word of God? Is your home a place where the Word of God fills it all? That's God's plan for His people in a dark world, is for the gospel to go forth in the home. But there's a second place that God desires for us to proclaim Him, and that's to all around us. To all around us. And the genealogy shows us that, that there's God's will is in a dark and hard world for us to still proclaim who God is to all those who are around us. Now remember, we just said they're all image bearers of God. They all are people who reflect God's image, though they don't even know that yet. And we get the joy as image bearers who know God to point image bearers who do not know God to know who he is. There's two in this line who are shown for doing this. And again, we see them highlighted. Go back to generation seven of Enoch. In verse, in verse 22 here, Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years, and he had other sons and daughters. So how do we know his walking with God included him proclaiming to other people? Because the New Testament tells us. The Holy Spirit inspired the author of Jude to show us something that Genesis did not, and that is what Enoch did. Look at Jude chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. It was about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones. Then in verse 15, to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And so here you were told in Jude that Enoch proclaimed the coming judgment of God. Now in Jude, it's talking about the return of Christ, but that would also be in view here, the coming judgment of the flood. There's only two or three generations 
away here. That Enoch walked with God, and the overflow of that walking with God was not just he stayed at home and withdrew and enjoyed as being a monk and joining God's presence. He went out to the pagan, lost, harsh sinners around him, and he warned them the judgment of God is coming. Repent. He called people to repent before it was too late. He didn't just keep the gospel at home. He took it to the lost around. So did Noah in the 10th generation here. Now, Noah will be described. We'll come to this in two weeks. But in Genesis chapter 6, verses 8 and 9, notice the similarity here. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man. Blameless in his generation, Noah, here's the same thing. He walked with God. And what was the overflow of walking with God? He proclaimed who God was to others. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 again tells us what Genesis does not. If he did not spare, if he, God, did not spare the ancient world, preserve Noah, a herald of righteousness. God preserved Noah. He was a herald. He was a proclaimer of righteousness. So we have modeled here in these two Places where the, the pattern is broken there in generation 7 and generation 9 are people who are proclaiming God not only at home, but to the world. It was a both and for them. They just declared who God was and they called people to repent. Now, friends, the reality is this will be hard for them. This was not an easy task for them. Remember Cain's line and how corrupt the world had been? That's the people that they are being called to go to. And though these particular families follow God, not all their other descendants did. These other sons and daughters, other sons and daughters, other sons and daughters, some of those began to veer from the Lord. So by the time you get to Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, this is the world in which they're to proclaim. In Genesis 6, 5, I think we have that on the screen for you. The Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That is the people to whom God sent this remnant to proclaim him to. They were supposed to proclaim the goodness of God to people like Lamech. So Genesis 4.23, this is one who they were in the same generation of Enoch who should hear the truth. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I've killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. They're to get the, the message of hope to a guy who boasts in his evil, who boasts in murder, who boasts in murdering a child. He's still an image bearer of God, and they're still called to take the truth to him, whether he believes or not. And friends, the same is true for us today. We still have the same mission of proclaiming Christ. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. I love this text. You're a chosen race, a royal priest, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, so that you may proclaim, shout out, advertise, herald the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. But that's not going to be easy for us either, because verse 12, a few verses later in First Peter 2, we're told to keep your conduct among the Gentiles. They're referring to the non-believers there to refer to, to keep this honorable, so that not if, but when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Then and now, friends, when we try to take the gospel to people who love their sin and love the darkness, they're not going to just be like, oh, yeah, that's great. I'm glad you believe that. There's going to be opposition to the gospel and opposition to believers. And so God knows they need encouragement. God knows we need encouragement. So how did God encourage them in these generations with this really hard task? We'll go back to verse 24. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. What in the world is this about? God supernaturally takes Enoch straight to heaven, bypassing death. Basically, as Enoch's walking with God, he's enjoying intimacy with the Lord in prayer and in worship, talking to God, and God's like, just come on into heaven, and boom, he is gone. It doesn't tell us in this text how God does it. It tells us it happened. Why? Because the point here is not how it happened. The point is it happened. And why did it happen? Not because God was lonely or needed him in heaven. God did this for the good of his people who were struggling. If you think about, again, this is generation 7. This is the same generation as Lamech. These are contemporaries. So Lamech boasting and murdering children and that being okay in the culture and the great evil and all this. God's people are probably struggling going, Lord, how are we going to ever make you known? Lord, how are we going to ever make it to death and walk with you? How is this possible? And God says, I'm going to give you hope. And he gives an example out of Enoch here and just ascends him straight up into heaven to remind his people that our salvation is sure as well. To remember that one day we too will be with God forever. To remind them this is not our home and by God's grace we can walk with him now even if it's costly. We can make him known even if it's costly because something better awaits us. God did this because he loved his people who were struggling in a dark world. So again, friends, it raises the question for us. How are we doing making Christ known? Our world is a hard place to make Christ known. It can be hard here, and it's even harder in a lot of the unreached peoples of the world. 
So how are we doing? Are we using our homes as a place for the gospel to go forth? Are we burdened for the lost around us? Are we willing to do the hard work knowing that this is not our home? Let's try to bring all that together from this text. Here's the main truth I want you to see from Genesis 5, and it's simply this, friends. In the midst of sin and darkness, we still are image bearers of God who are called to know Him and to make Him known. Now, friends, we are in a world just like the world of Genesis 5. It's a dark world where good is called evil and evil is called good, where there's resistance to the gospel here and abroad, where there's so much darkness, and in the midst of that sin and darkness, you and I are still image bearers of God who know it, who are living among a people who are image bearers of God who don't know it. And we get the joy of not only pursuing knowing God more, we get the joy of making him known. Friends, yes, we will struggle with sin just like all these men on this list did, and yet that sin does not remove the fact that God's put this calling on our life. That sin does not remove the fact that we still are his image bearers and God will still bless us to do his purposes. Friends, God has put us here, in the words of Esther, for such a time, as this, it's no accident, just it was no accident for these generations that God put them there to walk with him and make him known. It is no accident that you are in Montgomery, Alabama in 2024. You are here to walk with God and to make him known here and abroad. And so just like Adam and Seth and Enosh and Kenan and Mahalahel and Jared and Enoch and Methuselah and Lamech and Noah, we too can walk closely with God. It's not some magical formula. It's not something that's some secret that only a few people get. If you are a child of God, this is what God wants for you. He wants you to walk with him. That's what he gives his grace to do. That's why he gives you the word. That's why he gives you access to him in prayer. That's why he put his Holy Spirit within you. That's why you have community. It's so together you can find strength to pursue the means of grace and walk intimately with God just like these men did. But God's will for you and me is the same as also to make him known in our homes and to the culture around us in Montgomery, and to the ends of the earth. Friends, each of these expressions, apart from Enoch, all ends with that same phrase, and he died, and he died, and he died. And that's going to be said for me one day. It's going to be said for you one day. And so the question is between then, now and then, and we don't know when that then will be, will our lives be marked by walking with God? Will our lives be marked by making God known in our homes? Will our lives be marked by making God known to the lost around us? Will we leave an eternal legacy? Richard Phillips, one of my favorite scholars on Genesis, said this, Our stories will not end in our deaths, but in the lives of those we've touched and have encouraged in their faith and salvation. If we are used by God to lead others in following Jesus, we will leave a spiritual legacy that, like Adam's, will endure even into eternity. So, friends, as we think through the generations, how are we doing living, walking with God, and leaving a spiritual legacy for the generations to come? In the midst of sin and darkness, we still are image bearers of God who are called to know him and to make him known. Would you pray with me? Father, as we think about these people that you've used in the past, Lord, we recognize that, Lord, this is all your grace. Lord, for them to walk with you is because you opened their eyes to your glories and you gave them strength to do so. For them to make you known even when it's hardest because you gave them strength to do so. And Lord, we ask that you do that for us as well. Lord, you know the world into which you've put us. It's not an accident that we are here at this time. It's part of your sovereign plan. It's not an accident that we have the relationships with the lost people around us that you've given to us. It's not an accident that you have the nations before us. Lord, you have put us here to know you and to make you known. And so, Lord, we ask for much, much grace grace to walk with you, grace to proclaim you, grace to think about eternity and live with eternity in view. And so Lord, I do pray that as whenever the day comes for each of us and a set of us and he died or and she died, Lord, that we wouldn't come to the end with a ton of regrets, but that we come to the end being thankful for your grace that enabled us to walk with you and your grace that enabled us to make you known. So would you give us that grace? Would you be changing us and molding us and shaping us to be the people you desire for us to be so that we too could leave an eternal legacy that would give you great glory? And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing our closing song?
song would be our experience by your grace this week or that you would be our treasure you'd be what we rejoice in lord you know how quickly my heart and all of our hearts want to run after other things and finding our treasure in so many things besides you so lord this week would you give us much grace to find our treasure in you to find our joy in you to find our identity in you and to walk with you this week or do it for us for your glory and for our joy in jesus name we ask it Amen. God bless you, Gateway family. Have a great Sunday afternoon.